And now for something completely different, bees. So, you know, we think it's something different, but the reality is that bees are also our co-inhabitants. They're our collaborators in many ways. Our food security is dependent on what are essentially bugs to most people. And so that's the tie-in here. There's changes going on in the natural environment. There's changes going within our social fabric. This is part of this larger picture that we want to demonstrate. So I, I actually rarely get to see them this big. And so it's nice to, to look at that and think also, like, what if they really were that big? <laughs> we would have a lot more respect for bees at that point, <laughs> particularly the stinging part. OK, I'm distracting myself. So let me introduce Anthophora affabilis, collected in the badlands of North Dakota, probably on gumbo lily or perhaps on astragalus. Look at the size of just the tongue on that, and the architecture very different from uh, honeybees, which we'll talk about in a second. This is one of about 4,000 different species. I say about because we don't know the complete total of wild bees that for 250 million years have kept our North American um, fauna or flora of wild plants and um, in seeds and production. It's kept it going. Um, so I'm going to talk more about those, and I also want to contrast it with this. This is uh, the honeybee, which most people are familiar with. Most people are not familiar with the wild bees. Honeybees are radically different from our wild species. They're not native to the continent originally. They're brought in by the colonists right, almost right away. And everything that you know about honeybees, none of that applies to our wild species. No queens, no pollen collected by um, workers. Um, there's no waggle dances, there's no barbed stings, there's no honey, there's no wax, no hives. We can go on and on and on. I need you to just forget everything you know about honeybees when we talk about the native species. Additionally, honeybees are affected by quite a bit of a different set of problems. They have a whole set of introduced pathogens. Their populations are vulnerable right now. They're still effective within agricultural systems, but they're more expensive and they're subject to something that may be close to collapse if another insult comes along. So the reason we talk about wild bees, in addition to the fact that they're really interesting and they're just part of our inhabitants, is this is the backfill for honeybees. They're right now already doing a lot of our pollination in our agricultural systems. And as I mentioned before, they're taking care of all of our wild plants. So if honeybees get into further and further trouble, these are the things that are coming and um, replace those. So I want to show you just a series of slides showing you the diversity and the architecture of many of our different wild species. Some are, in fact, most of them are about the size of a grain of rice. Many of them are the size of bumblebees. In fact, about 50 species are, are bumblebees within the continent. So there's this huge amount of diversity going on here. And if you think about wildflowers, so all those sizes and shapes, we know about flowers a lot more than we know about bees. That size and shape of wildflowers, why does that exist? Because of this collaboration between the wild bees and the flowers. They're fitting, so to speak, one another. And so the architecture of the bees that you see here, these wild species, is mirroring the architecture of the flowers themselves. Different sizes and shapes of tongues, the body forms, the kinds of pollen they're used. It gets very complicated. I'd love to talk about it more, but I only have 10 minutes here. And I just want you to appreciate also the beauty that also, I think, mirrors the wildflowers that we know and love very well. These are, many of these occur just within our, our yards and our surrounding areas. We just ignore them because they're not stinging us. It's not a honeybee situation. We're not allergic to them, but they also don't provide us honey. They do provide us with the pollination services that we need for wildflowers and partially for our commercial crops. So, They've become more and more important as honeybees have become more and more vulnerable to uh, problems such as pesticides and um, the stress that's put on them. So we have many different kinds of things going on here. So this is a map. This is my only data map. So what we have is red are areas of decline or change. Here we have a change map. And blue are areas of increase. I wish I could say that this 
is a map of change in wild bee populations and that we really had that kind of data. We don't. We don't really have that information that allows us to speak to that. But we do for lots of other species, particularly the vertebrates. So birds, we study those, we love those. They've been on a radar screen for quite a long time. This is bobwhite quail. So bobwhite quail exists in these same environments that bees do, and they're the recipients of bee products, bee flower products, i.e. seeds is what they use, particularly during the winter. And they also use the same open environments, which are vulnerable now and declining. So we can look at this and a whole bunch of other species, and they're all showing the same pattern of decline and redness. And what we're seeing is a loss of flowers. So flowers are a driver for many things, particularly for bees, but they also are drivers for a lot of things that are dependent on them for cover, food, and, and those kinds of things. So the big issue is not pesticides for wild bees. Pesticides are an interaction that occurs within ag systems. Most of the wild bees that we're concerned about are in our natural areas and the areas we live in. The issues there are land use change and land change in general. The short story is we're simplifying things too much and we're losing many species. Bees are one of them, but many of the other birds that we track are too. So bees, all bees, honeybees, it doesn't really matter, all of them are obligate pollen feeders. No pollen, no bees, no flowers, no pollen, no bees, no pollen, no flowers, no bees, no seeds, no bobwhite quail, and a lot of other things. And you start doing that too much, and then we have system collapse, and we have to worry about larger things than just simply we, where are the bees. It's part of the thing that makes the earth um, go round. Another piece that's there for many of our wild species as compared to honeybees. Honeybees are generalists. They'll use a variety, they have preferences, of different kinds of plants in terms of pollen and nectar use. Many of our species, particularly in the deserts, there's, they're up to 50% are highly specialized. I, as a bee, only go to willow. I only go to cactus. I only use pontederia or a variety of different plants. So there's now, because of the specialization, this high specialization, again, look at plants and look at the different architecture, they're really working the bee system hard on this. There are generalists that will move into our crops, but many of the conservation concerned species are these species that specialize. So there's now a connection between not just flowers, you can't plant a bunch of clover and save all the bees. There's a connection between the diversity of the plants that are on the planet and the diversity of bees and many other insect species that are not part of that. So what does that mean? What we have to do is we have to think about feeding bees within our environment flowers. So if we look at the average landscape, we have lots of opportunity or lots of loss depending on how we play it. We have roadsides like this. They can either be mown and herbicided out of all their um, the blooming plant uh, uh, part of the spectrum and grasses and things like that are not used by bees. They need things that have flowers. That's why flowers exist. Um, we have then this connection again with the biodiversity. So really to save bees, it's not about chemical companies, it's about saving um, the plant diversity, and that means you and I. So we have access, we own land, we work with municipalities, we influence those kinds of things on how things are planted. This is my backyard, it originally was entirely lawn. You may not cultivate it in this way, but this is the type of integration where you bring back a component of the surrounding native vegetation, you sculpt it in particular ways that you would prefer to see, but if you have lawn, the, you can, at a very simple level, you're not doing the world a favor in terms of the environment. You need to be providing flowers if, you concern, if you're concerned about bees. So lots to talk about there in terms of the application, but the idea is to move away from lawn, corporate kinds of landscapes and bring back naturalized sorts of landscapes and do that in an aesthetic manner. So a trick is if you just stop mowing, people look at that and say, you know, what's going on here? Have you abandoned this land? This is laziness. This is not meeting my cultural idea of taking care of the earth or at least presenting ourselves as a community as an important, um, you know, a place we want to do business. So you can do that, but it's going to take more work on our part than simply stopping mowing or doing plantings. We have to do it in a way that's beautiful, that says, I did this on purpose. I'm not just lazy. This is my last one. So really, 
the opportunity here is to think about the places that you live and the, the, the lawns that you maintain and ask yourself, well, what is it that I'm doing here? Well, how am I playing a part in saving bees? In how can I move away from these kinds of lawnscapes and these um, places where, how can I work with the parks and the municipalities to add a little buffer around the playing fields, to add the um, highways into the town and leave some of those spots as wild or renaturalized areas. So it's very interactive. We really can't blame corporate um, or the chemical companies and pesticides for most of the problem. Most of the problem is really is something that we're um, involved in, something that we can affect ourselves personally. So I want you to walk away with some sense of responsibility for the problems that bees have here. That's pretty much all I say. Have I work for the government? So here's my government address, and we, all the pictures you've seen are downloadable. If you want more information about bees and all the nerdy little things that I am really interested in as a scientist, you can get in contact with me. Thank you.